Hello, and thanks for the invitation to give this talk. Despite the COVID time challenges, it's great to see all the high quality work that's being done with hierarchical planning right now. I'd like to talk to you about some of the questions I've encountered applying HTN planning to a wide variety of problems in the hopes that they provide interesting directions for research. Before I begin though, I'd also like to apologize in advance for my much less than Hollywood quality video production. I didn't trust Zoom not to hiccup during my talk, so I've taken the liberty of pre-recording it. I've written many papers, proposals, and so on that start by bragging about the capabilities of HTN planners, and particularly of the shop family of HTN planners, which I've worked with and on for many years. My bragging usually starts with the expressive power of HTN plans, building on the fact that an HTN can control the entire state trajectory a plan follows rather than only the start and end states. When I'm talking to people who care about applications instead of about planning, I usually explain that this lets them encode standard operating procedures and just because knowledge. In cases where you either want something done a particular way or there's something you want done even though you don't have a domain physics theory to specify why it is the right thing to do. In medicine, physicians call this empirical therapy. And in many cases, standard procedures involve things like maintaining a battery reserve that isn't an obviously goal-based thing to do. It's done because of something we know about the context in which our plans will be executed. The flip side of this claim is that there are relatively few applications that need the kind of puzzle mode thinking that modern first principle planners are so good at. So much so that we remark upon it when we find such an application. In my experience, for many applications, people don't even want you to find novel ways of solving a problem. Talking to users, they also often like the idea of decomposition of abstract tasks to more concrete subtasks. It's understandable to them in a way that, for example, forward heuristic search is not, and decomposition trees provide a form of explanation for the plan. There have been claims made off and on over the years that HTNs and HGNs can enable more efficient generally faster planning. This is certainly intuitively appealing. Why should our planners have to rederive the same procedures over and over from scratch, but raises other issues I'll return to later. Finally, the HTN plans with their top down and left right structure, when kept around as persistent data structures, can provide useful information and execution time, as this quote from Drew McDermott shows. For example, an HTN plan can provide information about the context for a given action. In some applications, we've written plan execution engines that traverse plan trees and bind variables at higher levels that influence the execution of primitives below them. For example, a robot that is traversing the countryside when doing it for exploration may use its camera in one way Whereas when just trying to go from point A to point B, it might use the camera in an entirely different way. Another sample use is identifying which conditions need monitoring at runtime and finding the implications of plan failures and disturbances as we do in our work on plan repair. This is the part of the talk where I confess to scruffy practices, hence the presence of the shame icon on this slide. Over my career, which has largely been spent in various forms of applied research, I have more often than not found it handy to be able to use expressive capabilities that violate the constraints of limited planning languages like strips and PDDL. This happens because lots of problems involve features that break the rules that allow us to say that our planners are sound and complete. There have been many arguments made that the right approach is to take your existing problem with all its complexities and compile it into a form that a standard PDDL planner can handle. In practice, I found this more difficult than it sounds, particularly because it can be quite hard to predict whether a 
domain independent planners heuristics will interact well or poorly with the compiled domains and problems. Also, as I've said before, often the search that these planners do isn't the core part of the problem we're trying to solve. Figuring out how to fix complex procedures to a new environment is often a key part of the problem. Shop 3 is a lifted planner whose preconditions language has full prolog expressive power and permits the invocation of arbitrary code and its preconditions. Because it does only state progression from one fully specified state to another, it can handle much more complex transition relations than partial order causal link planners. And indeed, Dana now has told me that planning for manufacturability with CAD systems was an important impetus behind the de development of the original shop planner. Such CAD systems can often tell us what will happen if we transform a piece of stock into a machined part, but typically can't describe what stock is capable of being transformed into such a part. The lifted nature of the planner has also been helpful to me on many occasions when I've been working on software composition applications. Such applications include problems like web services composition, Keith Golden's Unix softbot, planning image processing pipelines, and other data manipulation processes. In these domains, we often need to be able to manipulate things like strings and vectors, which is impossible in a PDDL style planner. Of course, one can build tables of entities and then encode and decode them. But as I said before, this begins to leave out the core of the problem. Another thing we often do in such problems is create new entities, such as files of data products. This violates the known domain of quantification constraint on classical planning, but typically doesn't do so in a way that is threatening. A modicum of care in how one uses quantification avoids any danger. A similar thing that we have done is to use HTN planning to automatically construct models for an SMT solver that proves properties of hybrid plans involving both continuous and discrete processes of change. I'm occasionally embarrassed by this rich expressive power, hence the shame icon, particularly when talking with hardcore practitioners of first principles planning who have a habit of pointing out how much human knowledge has to go into one of these HTN domains. I console myself with the reflection that the typical PDDL domain has been exquisitely crafted to fit the capability of, of today's planners by a combination of careful encoding and carefully excising features of the domain and often core features of the domain that don't fit in this particular Cinderella shoe. I'm gonna argue though, that all the th these things that we brag about are somewhat problematic. So let's take a step back and discuss what HTNs and HGNs are for. There've been really two different accounts of the purpose of these kinds of planners, and sometimes they get confused together. First, they can be tools to speed up search for solutions to conventional planning problems or second, they may be a way of getting at different questions, more ambitious ones, or ones more suited to at least some planning problems. So why should we care about this question? If HTNs and HGNs are just search speedups for more efficient PDDL planning, we can stick to our comfortable models and we have comfortable means to publish by demonstrating incremental speedups on the usual, uh, the usual suspects of IPC domains. I'm not sure the game is worth the candle though. I'm, I've, I'm afraid we're spending too much of our time getting better at solving problems that we should be outgrowing instead. Remember, while we can pick up PDDL problems from past IPCs, this doesn't mean these problems are natural entities. We're not picking them up by stepping out into the world and finding problems that need solving. At the end of the day, PDDL problems have more in common with crossword puzzles than with physics problems. So 
If you agree with me about the advantages of HDNs, how does that relate to this question and what are its implications? Well, for one thing, it means we should try to avoid claiming the expressive power of hierarchical planning techniques and then turning around and evaluating our work on PDDL benchmarks. And again, we see the shame icon because I've done this myself many times. It's easy to see why we do this because there aren't good repositories of HTN and HGN planning problems the way there are for PDDL. And there certainly aren't repositories of problems chosen because they require the additional expressive power that HTN supply. So this leads us to a closely related question. Why hierarchical task networks? Why aren't goals enough? And, and for the record, I, I mean that they are, as I say here, necessary but not sufficient. Um, and here are some reasons why they aren't. First, from an applications perspective, I've over and over again found that when I talk to people about what they want a planner to do, and I repeat the usual injunctions about tell me what, not how, I still more often than not get a verb phrase, an action description instead of an end state description. I often get an abstract action description, but it's still more often an action description than a goal state description. I think there may be something really counterintuitive about goal state des descriptions as a way of describing a task. Second, we see over and over again that when we try to build a planning domain with goals alone, we end up encoding trajectory constraints into the state predicates. This is sketchy because it can make this procedural knowledge sort of vanish into the domain. So it's less visible than it would be if I'd encoded it directly in a method or a trajectory constraint. A second point is, of course, that this makes a hash of the notion of conventional planning domains as being descriptions of physics rather than knowledge. Again, the distinction may be fundamentally unnatural. Surely we often learn procedures by performing them rather than from means ends reasoning. Furthermore, we have notions like that of affordance in which parts of our environment advertise their utility. We don't have to discover them. Finally, features of the trajectory are often as important as the endpoints. McDermott's famous example of running around a track for exercise illustrates this perfectly. So if we want to plan tasks as well as finding paths to goals, we have three fundamental challenges. First, when HTN planners fail, they often fail very badly, either because they simply don't have the knowledge they need to find a solution to an unforeseen problem, or they have this knowledge, but they get hopelessly lost in the search space. This latter can happen because when designing the methods, we don't take adequate account of what the planner will do when its search falls off the straight and narrow path to the solution. This is a problem that we see in many varieties of system that rely on human knowledge, not just planners. Many systems involving search have the characteristics that they either find a solution quickly or they never do. There's no phase transition here as there is in artificial search problems. Two. We don't have much beyond testing and hope to draw on to know whether or not our planner will do the right thing, given our domain model and a new problem. And finally, we don't have much of an execution semantics for our plans, not one that says much more about whether we've executed the plan well or badly when we take it into the real world where the assumptions of classical planning don't hold. Since I introduced the issue of brittleness of HTN planners, this is a good point to say a word about hierarchical goal network planning. Hierarchical goal networks are a way to attack the first of the three challenges. If we can give our HTN decompositions meanings in terms of goals, then we can hybridize our decomposition planners with first principles planners and then if we don't have a method to handle an unforeseen situation, we can fall back on the first principles planner to fill in the gaps. So 
I'm going to raise some problems with HGNs, but I should stop here to say I, I really like this work and I think it's a very good thing and on the right track. I would just like to suggest some ways to make free, further pro progress. So the key issue is that by limiting themselves to goals rather than tasks, HGNs sacrifice the expressive power that HTNs offer. You can't limit the set of plans the way an HTN planner does if you allow a classical planner to insert operators anywhere it wants to. Now, if you're familiar with the HGN work, you might object that there's a proof that an HGN planner can do anything an HTN planner can do, so my claim can't be right. Actually, we're both right. An HGN planner can do anything an HTN planner does, but only by adding new facts to represent task performance to the set of propositions of the model. So we can simulate an HTN planner with an HGN planner, but only at the cost of giving up the advantages of HGN planning. The three challenges to HTN planning all follow from the core mystery at the heart of HTN planning. What do HTN tasks mean? So why is this so important? Well, for one thing, if we wanna incorporate search techniques from first principles planners with action insertions that are not from task decompositions, we must have some account of what it means to insert an external task into a task network when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. For another, as we think about plan repair and replanning and other execution issues, we need to know whether a plan is repairable at all or is damaged beyond repair. Finally, if we're going to use HTN planners to suggest courses of action, We'd like to know if they're going to do the right thing or not. So what are some problems with our existing theoretical results? First, we often use convenient, less expressive formalisms when proving results about our tools. Our own work on plan repair has at least started out this way, hence the shame icon again, although we are working to extend our analysis to more complicated planning models. Another problem is that some of our analyses beg the question that we might hope they answer, as our two quotes imply. Vikas puts this very well. In HTN's tasks were treated as abstract symbols with no intrinsic meaning. They derived their semantics from the methods that decomposed them. So these results tell us only that we make de derivations correctly not that we can use those derivations to solve problems that we have. It's my considered opinion that our community will benefit from a research program that aims to give an independent semantics for HTN tasks and methods, and indeed for procedures in general. This will give us non-circular ways of answering questions about the intrinsic meaning of the tasks in our task networks. I've listed three desiderata here. First, since HTNs are distinguished by their control of state trajectories, the semantics must concern itself with trajectories. Second, the semantics should support correctness checking. And finally, it should be tied to plausible accounts of plan execution and plan construction. The former plan execution, I th think, is relatively obvious. The second, plan construction, is a little bit less so. But I'll try to make the case to you that methods should not only be correct, that is behave in accordance with task models when they're executed, but also useful in helping the planner construct plans. Otherwise, in the worst case, we could view a method that is completely sterile, that is never fully decomposed in a plan as being correct, but only in the sense of being harmless. A temporal logic is an obvious tool to build this semantics because temporal logics allow us to formally reason not just about states, but trajectories of states as well. And with modest extensions, we can bring the actions themselves within the scope of our theory. Modal propositional temporal logics are more than adequate to capture PDDL style domain dynamics. 
They typically provide modal operators such as eventually and globally or always, which are built on more fundamental um, operators like until and in the next state. As an aside, there are two different kinds of modal temporal logics commonly used, linear temporal logic and branching time or computation tree logic that have subtly different expressive power. Here I'm gonna use LTL just because its notation is simpler and it makes the points just as well. We can use these modal operators to specify constraints over behavior through constraints over temporal trajectories. For example, here are some property classes that were identified by Laura Humphrey and her co-authors as useful in reasoning about mission planning. So first there's a simple safety property. The UAV should never be near a power line. Second, the UAV should return home after its mission, but not before photographing. And third, the UAV should repeatedly visit and film regions P, Q, and R. Propositional temporal logics like this have been used extensively for modeling finite state machines, particularly for verifying digital hardware modeled as finite state machines. Model, model checking has been implemented either as unbounded model checking, where the checker computes, roughly speaking, the reachable space of a system's tra trajectories and compares it with the space of allowable behaviors or bounded model checking where the checker simply searches for a finite length trace, generally a counterexample that shows a property is being violated. The key concept in both of these is the notion of bisimulation. This is a formal way of comparing two different state trajectories, generally where one is an abstraction of another. So for example, we can check to see if a concrete implementation realizes an abstract specification in this way. This is critical to giving an independent account of task semantics. Using the same techniques, we can check to see if a transition system could exhibit a behavior that will violate some trajectory constraint. The kind of verification that model checking systems can do is generally overkill for the kind of plans we make plans which run determination and which don't have branching or non-determinism. These techniques have generally been used to verify reactive systems like controllers or CPU components, which nominally run forever. For example, the first specification on the last slide, repeated visiting of a set of target sites, doesn't make sense in a classical linear plan, but it might make sense if you had um, a UAV that stayed airborne indefinitely. On the other hand, these logics are much less expressive in terms of the state of the world than we need for many planning applications, and they treat the transition relation as just atomic. So um, note, by the way, though, that model checking techniques can be incorporated and have been incorporated in planners. For example, Chamadi et al. used model checking style computations to develop techniques for cyclic planning in which a plan may need to run indefinitely to reach its goal. And similarly, I've worked with colleagues on the circus state space planner, which generates timed control plans and used a uses a timed automaton model checker. Let's give an example of how this kind of independent semantics could be useful. Imagine we're in a hospital and we have an intubation protocol that says that the initial carer cannot try to insert an IV in a patient more than twice. And if that doesn't work, they must get an expert to try. And after that, if that doesn't work, must try either a pick line or a central line. We can translate this into a task definition that's independent of the HTN definitions in our plan library. The notation I've given here is a little indigestible, but we could assume that any real system there would have, would have a, some form of syntactic sugar to make specifications like this easier to read and write. Plan execution and plan repair are hard to get right without some independent task definition like this. 
What does it mean to intubate the patient successfully? Here we can see that the patient must end up intubated, but also that the way they get there must honor constraints that are intended to avoid injury and suffering. Consider how this changes the way we think about repairing plans. Most plan repair techniques assume that repairing a plan and execution is merely a matter of restoring some violated preconditions so that the plan has a new path to the goal state. Here, the task model would actually give, keep us from repeatedly going and getting IVs and trying to insert them. For example, if the patient has difficult to access veins. But note that this doesn't rule out trying more than once. We don't simply say you have to try a new method if the first one failed. This example shows that when we're repairing a plan, we should reject repairs that violate the task definition. And in some cases, we may have to give up the plan as irreparable. Some other ways we can use a model like this would be to enable us to decompose a unitary task model into comp components for easier authoring or maintenance and to check to ensure that when we've done this, those components can only be assembled in a way that honor the task constraints. We could also use this method to translate an HTN model into an HGN framework, since we could use the invariant to tell us what facts we would need to add to the state representation in order to remember them so that we generate only legal plans. Note, there's already a bit of an HGN flavor here, since the trajectory stops short successfully at any point when the patient is intubated. Thus, we capture the purpose of the task together with the trajectory that's required. What might we do if we wanted to extend these techniques to more expressive domain models? We'd like to be able to represent and reason about pretty complex states and transition relations, for example. In previous work, I've used Ryder's situation calculus for this purpose with the GOLOG extensions. The situation calculus is a first order temporal logic made up of states called situations that assign truth values to fluence and in which performing actions causes transitions from one situation to the next. This brings the situations and actions into one common framework that offers a number of useful features. Golog added features for composing together individual actions into program-like structures using constructs from logics of programming, including test, non-deterministic choice, parallel and sequential composition, and iteration. In a set of papers, Sheila McElraith and her students provided translations of temporal sequence predicates like the ones in LTL into SITCALC giving us a framework capable of reasoning about HTNs. Actions can be represented in SITCALC successor state axioms. McElraith and her students give us trajectory constraints like next, until, eventually, and always, and the GOLOG composition constructs let us capture the meaning of task networks. In this previous work, I've given an account of the way a shop plan could be executed that helps clarify the meaning of a number of HTN constructs, including method preconditions and protections, at least as used in SHOP, and an account of how SHOP generates plans. Together, these enable us to specify the desired meanings of tasks and at least theoretically verify the correctness of plans and methods. One important benefit this encoding could give us is the ability to reason soundly about what will happen when we extend our HTNs with new constructs. Of course, if we say you have all of prologue and use it, then all bets are off. But if we, for example, use a small set of prologue predicates or only in a limited way violate the finite, um, the finite domain constraint, we may be able to show that we can still be sound and complete at least relative to a particular plan library and class of initial states. While machinery like this is theoretically adequate, it's far from certain at this point that it can be cached out into useful reasoning about HTN planners. I've been able to build some proofs primarily using tree induction, but it's been a fairly cumbersome process. 
it's clear that we would need some automation support for any theory like this to be of practical use. If nothing else, we'd need to be able to replay previous proofs when a plan library has changed in order to permit extension and maintenance of verified plan libraries. There are a number of prologue implementations of the SIDCALC and GOOG that could be used to find trajectories given a set of constraints and a GOOG program, like the ones I translated shop plans into. In theory, by composing that kind of projection with the execution of a temporal representation of a task description, one could do some form of model checking. We could also write theories about the execution environment, in, again, in the form of GOOG programs, and compose them with the plan in order to investigate how the plan might go under conditions of at least known unknowns, as the saying goes. At present, it's not clear how much more satisfactory this kind of checking would be than generating exhaustive sets of plans through the planner and matching these directly against the temporal constraints. What I mean is without a strong notion of search control or the kind of radical compression of the state space that we see with BDDs, neither of these seems terribly promising. More promising, I believe, would be to directly use an automated tool that can use tree induction. And for this purpose, I've been experimenting with the PVS proof assistant and have built up representations of some of these theories in the language of that tool. But clearly, there's a lot of work to be done here. So those are some thoughts about the way using HTN planning and applications has suggested research directions to me. I hope they were of interest to you and that you find some productive directions for your own work there. I look forward to talking to you in the workshop sessions, and thanks for listening.